Welcome to this episode of The Accidental Geographer. I am The Accidental Geographer, Vincent Del Casino. With me today is Dr. Erica Berman, Director of the Ira F. Brilliant Center for Beethoven Studies and Assistant Professor of Music and Dance here at San Jose State University. Today we will delve into the work of Beethoven and the context in which that work was produced in the city of Vienna. This music became part of a growing consumer culture in Europe at the time, as access to music became commercialized. It is a fascinating and surprising trip through Beethoven's contributions. If you think you know all there is to know about Beethoven, think again. So let's get right into it. I'm really excited to have Dr. Erica Berman here with me today. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time. Oh, thank you for inviting me. You're, you're welcome. So from Manchester to San Jose, sounds like a natural sort of move. You know, tell me a little bit about sort of your interest in Beethoven, your interest in music more broadly, and this journey you've been on, you know, um, academically and professionally and probably personally as well over the last, you know, decade or so. Sure, yeah. Well, I grew up in Scotland and then I moved to Manchester for, um, for school. And I started my life as a performing musician. So I studied violin at the conservatory before um, sort of accidentally discovering music history um, when I was taking a bit of break from playing because I had an injury that prevented me from actually doing anything physical. So I got more into the academic side, ended up doing a doctorate and um, getting my first job at a university in the UK. And what brought me here was the Beethoven Center. Um, which is a real jewel. It's um, the only center, uh, or rather it's the largest center outside of Germany, the largest center in North America devoted to Beethoven. So it's a very well-known and respected archive and museum um, that has resources that I used through grad school as well. There's an online bibliography database that I made really good use of. So um, it's, you know, the world is quite interconnected so all the Beethoven scholars kind of know each other so I'd known about the center I knew the previous director Dr. Will Meredith and uh, when this job came up I went for it and uh, that's what brought me here so yeah it's it's a long journey but it's uh, it's rewarding and it's, it's nice to kind of you know follow your interest and yeah. yeah so what's so interesting is um, you know we find this a lot, particularly with academics. I never thought when I started college, I was going to get a doctorate. I was going to be a geographer. I was going to do work in Southeast Asia. So what, what made you, what prompted you to start to think about music history? I mean, logically you had a passion for music and for playing music, but what, what prompted you to start to think about music history in particular? There's something really special about music history, I think. I mean, I, I love history as well. I love kind of trying to put yourself in the shoes of people from a different time. And what music can do that other kinds of history can't do is let you hear what, what things sounded like. You know, it, music is such an amazing uh, kind of form of culture because it survives through time and... Um, you know, most of history is silent, but music history just brings everything to life. And I think it's amazing that we're still engaging with the same sounds that people were engaging with a couple of hundred years ago. Um, so that I think is what really, for me, it's about people. It's about life, you know? So um, that's why, I mean, I love music anyway. I've always loved Beethoven's music. But if you kind of start with music as a starting point and then explore the history around that, it tells you so much more because it's the history of what people find beautiful and the history of what people do for fun and, you know, what drives people and what makes people passionate. So it's really one of the most human forms of history, I think. That's a really fascinating way to put it. I've never had someone so kind of eloquently wrap up the intersections of music and history and what it provides to us. You know, as a social scientist myself, I've always loved the mundane and the engagement with people and lived experience and, and, and what you're saying here is you're really getting at that lived experience historically through music. That's really powerful. Exactly. So what else? I mean, it obviously tells us about those, but it also tells us about larger social, political, and economic experiences of the time in which the music was produced and so forth, right? You could really almost 
understand Vienna right through that music and what it meant, right? And especially through Beethoven, because Beethoven, I mean, he's this towering cultural figure in Western music, um, but he lived through such an interesting time. So the whole of European society was going through this huge change. You had the Napoleonic Wars, you had the French Revolution, and questions about what is music for and who is music for. Um, and Beethoven is right at the heart of that. And not only did he live through this amazing time, but he also, we have just the most incredible documentation of his life. And one of the most famous things about Beethoven is that he was deaf. So from his kind of late 20s, he started to go deaf. So by the final 10 years or so of his life, he was communicating quite frequently in writing. So we actually have written conversations that Beethoven had with people. And you're talking about the mundane, you know, about the, the kind of daily life. Well, that, I mean, that's a fascinating resource, even if it wasn't from Beethoven, you know? So what, what are people talking about in, in the cafe 200 years ago? So they're talking about the newspaper, daily affairs, that sort of thing. Um, and we have tons of letters from Beethoven and he was such, he was, I guess, the first real towering figure in Western music that was kind of famous in his day. So we have a lot of people's reminiscences and anecdotes and things like that. So um, yeah, he's just an incredibly rewarding figure to study from all kinds of angles. Um, so you can learn about daily life, you can learn about politics, history, European history, and of course music just by engaging with what we have from Beethoven. Well, and it speaks to this like I mean, there's an entire field of Beethoven studies. There's journals, right? Academic journals around this. And yet, you know, you could almost expect the sort of lay person's question is like, how much more can we really know or excavate from Beethoven and the work that he did? Yeah, I mean, obviously there's been a huge amount of work done over the past couple of hundred years, but the things that are ongoing are for a start, there's a lot of, documentary stuff that people come back to with different questions every time. So, you know, people go through it the first time and they want to know what was Beethoven doing, what's going on with Beethoven. But, but now, you know, as music history starts to ask bigger questions, we want to know things like, well, how is he engaging with the commercial world of music at this time when the kind of mass market is starting to come into play? Um, and something that I'm working on right now is the world of ballroom dance, which is not something we normally think of with Beethoven. But that for me gives me another angle. I go in looking through all of his works and I think, well, what, what was he writing this for? Who was going to dance to this? And how, you know, how often would people hear this music and how often would they hear his symphonies? Um, and then you start to see that daily life in Beethoven's time slightly differently from what we might think, you know, because we, we know Beethoven, he wrote these incredible symphonies. So that's what we tend to think of. But actually those works were not a huge part of the music scene 200 years ago, you know? So the idea that we're piping this music out of YouTube right now is just kind of alien. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really, and I want to get to that because I think your, your papers are really interesting. I learned a lot about the sort of what our projection back historically on what a Vienna might have looked like or been like because of Beethoven's, um, elevation is such a monumental figure and then to have an expert really start to pull apart well it's much more complicated than that and you know he, he was doing great work at the time but it wasn't the work that necessarily was at the front or the forefront of Viennese society at the moment um, so that's that, that is really interesting that's true and that the kind of values of what we value of Beethoven also changes over time so there were some things that Beethoven worked very hard on that we as people 200 years later don't consider to be classical music. So he wrote some kind of festive pieces that are designed for kind of cheap thrills. And the kind of values around music evolved after Beethoven's lifetime to value some things over than others. Um, and these things have puzzled uh, musicians, you know, you really have to think, if you're going to think historically, you've got to think about the actual landscape of the whole music scene, rather than just looking at just symphonies or operas or whatever. Well, and it, what it suggests too is, uh, 
from a theoretical perspective is Beethoven is constantly being rewritten and reread, right? And, and therefore, you know, pulled in th- to your point then that's what makes the the history interesting right is the influence over the centuries and what gets picked up and what doesn't and how it's how it's reimagined right so those influences change over time is that correct that's right yeah and actually for a long time um the image of beethoven got fairly stuck there was a big mythology that that emerged around beethoven you know he's the kind of archetypal uh tortured artist you know, with this great flaw, with his deafness. And so he got kind of pinned down as this um, striving, struggling, miserable, uh, bad-tempered genius, um, which there obviously is some truth in because we, we have a lot of information about his life, but there are also other sides to Beethoven that are not belonging to that myth. So um, it's kind of only in the last... I don't know, the last few decades that people have started to, to try and move away from that myth as being the only representation of this really important um, time in music history and start to try and, try and see the whole picture. Well, and, and you know, um, Walter Benjamin is famous to say that history is all about the now as well, right? And so it, it often tells us as much about what we're trying to figure out as what we're trying to figure out from Beethoven, right? That's exactly true. And actually, this is a really interesting time to think about that because this year, 2020, is the 250th anniversary of Beethoven's birth. Oh. So, yeah, all around the world... There were huge festivities planned. We at the Beethoven Center had a whole series of events planned. And of course, the pandemic meant that most things didn't happen or they happened in some kind of small online form. Um, so that's, that's really interesting. But what that has started to make me think about is all the other moments in history when they've commemorated Beethoven. So the last big one was 1970. And that was kind of Beethoven on a global scale for the first time. So Beethoven in the the Far East has become much more of a phenomenon, especially in the 20th century. And then 100 years ago, 1920, that anniversary doesn't really, nothing much happened then. And one of the reasons was that Europe and the world was still recovering from the Spanish flu pandemic and stuff wasn't really happening. And of course, the the First World War as well. Um, And then 50 years before that, uh, 1870, you've got the cusp of uh, German unification and the birth of the German nation. And of course, Beethoven looms huge in German history. So that's their big cultural symbol. So yeah, it's really kind of interesting just to reflect right now about what have we valued about this particular body of music and this particular cultural figure over the past two centuries. And uh, how are we going to remember this year? (laughs) Yeah, no, it is, it is. It's so interesting. So some of this is caught up in the British broadcasting of the BBC do- documentary. You you were involved in a documentary about Beethoven and his influences. Can you tell us a little bit about that production, its goals, and w- what you what your c- contributions were to that? Yeah, so there is a year long series which is actually still ongoing, um, broadcast by the BBC Radio Three, which is the classical music station. Um, where every other week, there's a week of programs, Monday to Friday, um, exploring, well, Beethoven. And the composer of the week is the name of the program. And usually there's one composer per week. So this, this is basically composer of the year now. And what they've done is created a, a sort of, um, kind of like an audio book of Beethoven's life and works. So you get a bit of uh, history and a bit of music kind of taking you through. And then there's also been themes that have, uh, being explored about different aspects of Beethoven. So uh, things to do with performance or things to do with Beethoven himself, you know, as a figure or as a creative mind. Um, and my role in this has been a, a kind of consultant. I was involved from an early stage about putting the thing together and what do we want to cover and what do we want to leave out. Um, and I also uh, did some recordings. Some of them were in Bonn, in Beethoven's birthplace in Germany, which we recorded at the beginning of February when we were still allowed to travel. <laughs> um, so that was really exciting to have, have done that on location in Beethoven's birth house and looked at some of the items there. That's, that's really interesting. So 
you you've taken up a lot then of of you know obviously with Beethoven Beethoven as your center focus and in one of your earlier papers I think in Arietta I think I think that's how you pronounce it um, you talk about the influences on Beethoven because obviously Beethoven's not in a vacuum right he emerges in Vienna at a particular time with a particular scene around him so what are some of those early influences on him and how does the city itself of Vienna kind of play is not just a backdrop, but part of his life that probably influences how his, his music evolves. Yeah, I mean, that's, there. all of these questions are so interesting when you apply them to Beethoven, particularly just because of the time he lived in. So his big musical influences were Haydn and Mozart, who were a generation or two generations uh, before him. Actually, Mozart was not that much older than Beethoven, but he died so young that they didn't really have a chance to kind of work together. Um, but Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven are the three big composers we think of as the kind of Vienna school from that time. And they developed the symphony and the string quartet, all of these big instrumental forms that we still hear on concert programs today. Those guys shaped them to the forms that we now know and understand. Um, but in terms of Vienna and its, its influence on Beethoven, I mean, the big thing in Beethoven's lifetime was the change in the way people engage with music. So this is the beginning of the music publishing industry. So music becomes a commodity in this period. It's something that you can buy and sell quite cheaply. And the middle classes are on the rise, which seems to happen at every point in history. The middle classes are on the rise, but they're really in this, uh, at this moment, you have a lot of people being able to afford to buy stuff. So culture becomes like an industry and Beethoven is one of the first people to engage with that. Um, and one of the things that that does for his music, if you think about Beethoven's symphonies, he composed these works, which are nine symphonies and they're long and they're big. They're much bigger and more grand and kind of serious than Haydn's. Haydn wrote more than a hundred symphonies. And the reason is that Beethoven was composing for a ticket paying public. So when he puts on a symphony, it's like a one-off special thing. He has to pay all this money to hire the orchestra and uh, hire the hall. And if he doesn't make money, it will be expensive. So when Beethoven writes a symphony, it's like a real commitment. It'll take six months to do it and it'll be something new and big and special so that people will remember it. But a generation before, they didn't have that kind of market. So that was more, you know, Haydn wrote his symphonies because he had to entertain the prince who was paying his salary. So he would turn off six symphonies for the season and that would be, you know, the way he engaged with it. So it's kind of like this combination of the musical influences and the changes in culture and society and politics and economics that kind of are this recipe for Beethoven's music doing what it does. So the emergence of the industrial revolution and the production of a mass consumer society has this profound influence on Beethoven. Yeah. And, you know, normally we have no of, idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, normally we think of Beethoven in opposition to mass culture. So as, as classical right. music, he's kind of like the art, you know, he's the, the big against the commercialization of art. Uh, and what you have for the first time with Beethoven is the polarization of cheap stuff and art which people hadn't really thought of before in terms of music. Um, and Beethoven sort of managed to navigate that market in a way that he was able to do his own thing while still getting the support from the people who had the money and being able to sell his music relatively widely, some, some of it. So, you know, I guess, yeah, sorry. No, no, no. It's it, it, it. I'm just getting really it, it, just so interesting. You know, as a geographer, I think of the kind of divisions in the city, the way in which this emerges, the fact that new spaces are going to be opened up for this level of consumption. But then how that plays out against the relations of class politics, that's clearly going to be rife. And you talk about in this paper of the connoisseurs and the amateurs. Right. And and sort of what. What's so interesting here is you, you're making an argument or teaching me that, that um, high art had a different sort of sensibility at this period of time. And, and, Mozart, uh, and Beethoven's work might not 
have centered always in, in that, right? It might have been too broad for the for the high end connoisseur, so to speak. Yeah, it's funny that the the sort of the real strict divide between this is culture and this is just commercial really came about after Beethoven's death. So it's sort of later people who kind of appropriated this this bit of Beethoven. This is ours. And the rest kind of got forgotten. Um, and there, you know, that distinction was obviously there to an extent in Beethoven's lifetime. It's quite clear that this is music that's really serious and this is music that's just for fun. But that kind of value judgment that comes with it was not so polarized then. You know, it's not a contradiction for someone to write the Ninth Symphony of Beethoven and then also write some little ditties for, for, for fun. Um, that kind of didn't trouble people as much in Beethoven's lifetime as it has troubled later generations of music critics. <laughs> but, and so in some ways, the shorter symphonies might be followed by other shorter pieces, right? That would make up a show as opposed to the long symphony that was a sort of consistent that Beethoven started to do, if, if I'm understanding this correctly. Exactly right. And, um, you know, the idea now, when you think of a classical music concert, with the turn the lights down and everyone listens attentively and you all have to clap in the right place. That's a culture that um, grew up around a specific idea of what classical music does. So that, uh, again, slightly after Beethoven, you know, Beethoven's music is kind of pointing in that direction. But this kind of moral value that is placed on classical music is something that kind of makes you better. You know, um, if you've seen those CDs that are Mozart for making you smarter and things like that, that's a very specific kind of ideal about what music is for. Um, that didn't exist exactly in that form during Beethoven's lifetime. So, you know, I think it's something really important to think about when we think of how we engage with classical music in a concert hall. That is a kind of artificial culture that um, has just become solidified since the 19th century. But there are plenty of other ways of engaging with, with music from that time. So you're saying people didn't play Beethoven to their pre-born babies to make them smarter in Vienna or Beethoven's time? <laughs> I, I don't think so. No, I think that's a uniquely, a uniquely I guess, late 20th century phenomenon. <laughs> Might be uniquely American as well. I don't really know, uh, but anyway. So, so this is really interesting. So you turn you turn then to the paper you wrote on three symphonies in one year. This is, there's an interesting question because you didn't complete the third, right? Is that correct? Um, and this is sort of an 1812 venture, and it's a pretty bold one, right? But there's also it's tied up in who Beethoven is becoming as a person, right? Of why he's attempting this project what it means so tell me just a little bit about what the goal what his goals were or what he was trying to accomplish or what we understand he was trying to accomplish with this kind of large adventure right yeah so that paper that i wrote uh, sort of it focuses on just what we're talking about now which is the kind of the social and economic factors that Beethoven had to navigate when he was composing. So the, the three symphonies were the Seventh Symphony and Eighth Symphony of Beethoven, which are two really big works, and a third one. And his plan was to write all of these in one go and probably put them all in one concert. So it would be like, hello, everyone, here's my new symphonies. But that didn't pan out because he wrote number seven and eight and then couldn't get them performed for a couple of years. So he'd spent all of this time, you know, each symphony took him about six months. And while he was writing them, he was not selling stuff or performing or making money. So this is a huge investment. And actually uh, for Beethoven, that didn't, you know, didn't immediately pay off. And then it, it just happened that he got tons of performances uh, a couple of years later because of some festive things that were happening at the end of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, but... What that tells you about Beethoven is that he's, uh, you know, having to having to kind of respond to the circumstances that are are thrown at him and um, compose to try and balance what he wants to do with what he can actually feasibly do. 
Um, so three symphonies in one year was not feasible. Um, so it ended up being two symphonies, um, two symphonies and some other stuff that he could then sell. When you talk about that writing, and it, if you don't mind me quoting yourself back to you, you write the symphony was in great, it was in general decline at the time with limited opportunities. And so Beethoven could expect far greater financial returns from composing sonatas and other chamber work. So Vienna was changing in its consumptive habits in music at this point. And he was struggling, it sounds like, with his passion and what he wanted to produce, but the realities of having to make a living and being, you know, uh, maintain his lifestyle within the context of Vienna. That's exactly right. And the, the symphony being in decline is because who is paying for music is changing at this time. So previously... Um, rich aristocrats tended to have their own orchestra. So that would be part of their household would be the musicians and music would be part of their kind of culture that they're cultivating. It's like a status symbol to be cultivating art, kind of like commissioning things now. Um, and that changed partly because of general society and culture changing. So you have the French Revolution and suddenly the aristocrats don't so uh, music becomes more like a commercial enterprise and actually the middle classes and people who uh, don't have their own orchestra but still engage with music have a bigger role in shaping what composers do because composers have to respond in some way to who's paying for what they're doing um, so that's why Beethoven wrote fewer symphonies because he didn't have someone who wanted a symphony every week but when he wrote them they were bigger and longer and more obviously for a concert, you know, this is for people to pay money to come and see. So um, what's so interesting, you think about the print culture emerging and, and music, but music didn't require a certain level of, of literacy, right? So it had an accessibility that printing presses and the, and the ability to print words and mass communicate that way still had a whole educational system, right? That was needed. But what's interesting here as well is the intersection with Beethoven's personal life with you sketch out because the symphonies are probably more appealing to him because of his on his ongoing uh, lack of ability to hear, right? His in, in, he eventually becomes completely deaf, I believe. So how, why is the symphony kind of a helpful space for him relative to his own deafness? Well, the symphony became his, main way of communicating with audiences when he couldn't play anymore. We think of Beethoven as a composer, but actually he was equally a pianist. And um, in his early years, he was a performer composer. So he would compose works and he would also perform them. And the big work for him was the piano concerto, because that was a way of him showing off not only how great he is at composing, but also how great he is at performing. And so that's a much more personal kind of involvement with the music. But when he couldn't perform anymore, um, he was no longer able to participate in the concert. So all of the kind of compositional energy then went into the symphonies, um, which, you know, he might attempt to conduct, but really he's not making the music. He's composing it for other people to perform. Yeah, that is that is really interesting. But he he I mean, obviously heard it in his head as he put it together, but he wasn't able to produce it in a way. Right. That that is so interesting. So I want to I, I guess I, I don't know if it's a gear shift, but I want to get to the book project because I love this opening chapter. Thank you for sharing it with me. So oh, thank the you, title me. of the book is The Vietnamese Ballroom in the Age of Beethoven. And I'm going to have to tell you, it's not it, naturally I would have went, huh, I don't know. That's the thing. But I, I'm so glad I'm reading this because I, I just found it really compelling and really interesting. Again, because of just my, my, fascination, my fascination with the mundane and the everyday and the way in which this works. And you write, while Beethoven's work have traditionally been the standard reference point for studies of Vietnamese musical culture, this book adds to a growing body of scholarship that seeks to position his career within the wider landscape of Viennese music making. For you, what is music making? And, and how is that different from or related to music? Well, for me, the difference is what are people most likely to hear on a daily basis? 
So are they most likely to hear uh, the Beethoven works that we know now? So when we think of the Viennese classical period, we think Mozart, Beethoven, Haydn. Um, but that's just a relatively small portion of the music that was being performed and composed then. And the ballroom was just completely at the center of Viennese social life. So the Viennese ballroom is their kind of 19th century ballroom, right? It's the main influence on ballroom dancing, the Viennese waltz, um, all, all of the Strauss polkas and waltzes, that's all from Vienna. And um, so, yes, there, you know, most people engage with music, but everyone danced. So everyone from all classes, uh, the ballroom was in some way a part of their social life. So all of the music in the ballroom is you know, much more present in the sort of sound world of Beethoven's Vienna than his symphonies, which might get performed only a handful of times during his whole lifetime. So um, what's really interesting about this music is that most of it's now completely forgotten, but it had a really big influence on the music we have from Beethoven and Mozart and Haydn. A lot of this music has references to dance in it. And so that's kind of, you know, helps us to understand where that comes from. Um, and, and just to think about what Vienna sounded like. Um, the thing that has really brought this to life for me is that um, on my street here in San Jose, there's an ice cream truck that goes through the neighborhood that one of the tunes it plays is... I, I couldn't believe it when I first heard it, a really obscure ballroom dance by Mozart from 1791 <laughs> that I wouldn't have known until I'd started working on this book, even though I, I'm, you know, I'm a specialist in classical music, but it's obscure even for classical music specialists. And so probably nobody else in the neighborhood knows or cares who this melody is by, but the fact is it's there. It's part of what we hear. And that's just amazing that that survived more than two centuries and crossed the Atlantic somehow, you know, who knows how it ended up in the ice cream truck repertoire. Yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> well, what's so interesting about this again, like is at this point of mass consumption and the ability to, you talk about the, where is the ballroom? How do we locate it? Right. And you say many of the city's ballrooms were restaurants and coffee houses, right? They were, they were simultaneously, they were multiple things to people. And so it democratized in some way the access to this music and also to the dance itself, right? Absolutely. And I think the the fact that these social spaces, which were new, the coffee house was kind of new, the pub, you know, the public place where you go and sit and you read the paper and you chat and you spend money was still a relatively new thing. And and the ballroom only started in the 1770s as a public thing. So there was a rule, okay, now you can sell tickets to for dance. And that culture just kind of exploded during Beethoven's lifetime. So there initially there's five ballrooms and by the 1820s there's 50, between 50 and 100. And all of these are playing music as part of their background and part of the fabric all the time. So you just, you can't escape, <laughs> you can't escape dance music, it gets everywhere. Um, more, you know, more than any other kind of music in that, in that time. You know, when you think now, when you go into shops or, or what you watch TV, there's music there. And so the equivalent of that in Beethoven's lifetime is really this dance music. It's so interesting because, um, you know, and yet, the, as you mentioned, this music has been so marginal relative to the canon. Like it shows up in places that you don't expect it and you hear it and all of a sudden go, I can't believe I'm hearing that. And I would have, not recognize it. it it's almost too mundane or, or you taught you touched on this in the in the opening chapters of the book that it also may have to do with the discipline's own int or lack of interest in the body and the kind of daily comportment of the body so how do theories of embodiment and physicality play into your kind of now renewed passion for this dance music and its meaning in everyday life well, this sort of ties in with what we were talking about earlier about um, the sort of code around classical music, which is that you sit in silence and you don't move and you engage with it that way. And that's a very 19th century idealistic way of thinking about music, which is that it's this intellectual exercise. And so all of your activity is happening intellectually, not physically. And there was even, I mean, there was... Uh, 
influential writers on music in the 19th century who actually said music that makes you dance is kind of morally it's like base impulses it's like you know that's what savages and animals do you know so any child will respond to music that way but it takes a real cultured mind uh to respond to music intellectually so thinking about this music as dance music sort of really challenges that especially as this dance idea is so present in in the classical masterworks that people listen to in the concert hall with this kind of serious attention um and you know it's it's really kind of eye-opening to start to engage more with the physical side and imagine listening to this music as someone who just has been to a ball and feels the steps and, and responds to the music as dance you know doesn't just hear the rhythms but actually feels uh what it feels like to dance and it actually um it's a different way of engaging with music. It's another layer. It's like adding a new dimension, like extra colors or, or whatever. And um, yeah, it's been really eye-opening for me. And one of the most fun things has been learning to do some of these dances and uh, going to the ballroom and understanding what it feels like to then dance to music that you're familiar with from another context. And it just, it adds to the whole experience, you know, the movement and the listening kind of happen at the same time. And it's, it's yeah, it's great. It's, it's that intersection of the affective and the emotional and the haptic and the tactile, you know, there, there's touching, there's things that uh, uh, many scholars have felt uncomfortable for centuries to talk about. It's only been in the last 40, 50 years with the emergence of feminist and so forth that people are even willing to engage these sorts of things so there to your point of how things get up and and taken up at particular points in time we're in a moment in time and space where we're finally comfortable enough to at least have conversations about the bodily about body it's about you know um the the more emotional kind of connectivity that we have that was essential to everyday life here in vienna right during this period of time exactly and essential to vienna uh in the later 19th century which is the really the vienna of the waltz johann strauss who's the kind of pioneer of popular music he's been described as the first kind of global popular music phenomenon so you know people have been more comfortable applying it to that world because that is very clearly belongs to commercial music um, but people have been less comfortable about thinking of the Viennese classics, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, as engaging with that same uh, world of the body and the entertainment and the, you know, the fun, <laughs> which is what dance is. It's fun. It is fun. It's, it's meant to, yeah, it's meant to create connection and community and all those things. Well, by the way, you are an absolutely beautiful writer. So I'm sure the rest, I can't wait for the rest of the book. Cause I, I oh, thank you. You can, you, you really grip people. You bring them into the story in a way. And there's a theoretical sort of um, power to the work that I I'm just, I'm finding really interesting. So I'm definitely looking for, I want to shift gears one more time because you are in this amazing center, you know, with all this stuff around you and it, and it's cool stuff. And I, I like to use the word stuff because there's just so much of it. Can you just tell us a little about the center? Like what kind of objects you have, how you curate that, you know, who has access to it? It's just generally interesting that what a pleasure for us to have something like that at San Jose. And then I have a scholar of your caliber working with it. Just, you know, walk us through. Sure. I mean, the, the kernel of the collection was the private collection of Ira F. Brilliant. Uh, when he donated his collection to San Jose State, it was around between 70 and 80 first editions, first edition prints of Beethoven's music, which, um, you know, have value and they're uh, just like the first editions of other, other uh, literary works. Um, and that uh, collection of uh, 75 items is now over 30,000 um, items and objects of different kinds. So this collection has been constantly expanded since the 1980s. So uh, an almost complete collection of the first and early editions of Beethoven's music. 
some manuscript materials, so we have things in Beethoven's own handwriting, um, plenty of images, which is great for me as a historian because it brings to life the world that Beethoven lived in and the places he saw and the places he lived. Um, and then this fabulous collection of historic keyboard instruments, um, which bring to life the sound world of Beethoven's day. So we can hear Beethoven's music um, on the instrument that he composed it for, uh, which is kind of eye-opening or rather ear opening um, for a lot of people as well. And it's open to the public. We always have items on display um, that people can look and we kind of circulate them in and out of the vault. Um, and we do different exhibitions um, a couple of times a year so that people can come and look and see what we have. And you get to play those really cool pianos too, don't you? Yeah, and so do visitors. Um, they're there to be played. So we have um, a couple of original instruments which are two centuries old, which we try and protect so we don't let kids bang on them. But we <laughs> will happily demonstrate them for people. Um, so, and, and we have replicas that people are allowed to play as well. So yeah, so that's what I love about the center is it's kind of hands-on, you know, it's not just things that you're not allowed to touch, but it's actually come and, come and play, come and try, uh, which is what music should be, I think. Well, and it must be so cool because you, you must get connected to scholars across the globe on a daily basis who are not only interested in the virtual collection, but kind of what, you know, ha has most of it been digitized? So it is available. It, you know, how, how is it accessed? So we are, uh, we do have a substantial digital collection, which is always growing. Uh, we haven't digitized everything. I, d I think that was, that would be, take years, but we're really doing uh, what we can. So sometimes people request specific things that we have, and then we try and make sure that they're digitized. And these are all available through our website for people to scan and browse. Um, and yeah, it's true that there's people all over the world that connect with us, especially scholars. But what I love is connecting with the non-scholars um, because the center is ultimately public facing. And you know, often in a university, you just talk to other scholars and you're writing for other scholars and you sort of forget that there's people out there who actually like music <laughs> and care about Beethoven you know, because they're passionate about it. So for me, coming face to face with that enthusiasm on a regular basis is just one of the joys of working there. Oh yeah, no, it sounds, it sounds, and it's located in that beautiful King library. So, you know, it's a really nice place. Um, Eric, I think I could talk to you for hours about this stuff. It's really interesting. And I'm so glad you're able to share your work with me and take time to ha have this conversation. Um, you know, I think the center is a really unique asset that the institution has, but it's brought to life by the work of you and others who do it. So I'm just excited to have you as a colleague and really appreciate that you've taken the day out with me and teach me about uh, things we can learn Beethoven and Beethoven studies. So thanks so much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.